Yeah. And um okay. Sorry. Um I wanna let's see who can read. Um Wayne, can you read? Yeah, sure. She put it on okay. the screen for me. Sure. Okay, did I hit I'm hitting recording and now I'm gonna hit share. And there you go. Okay. Special guest speaker, Vanessa Whiteberger. Vanessa Whiteberger was born in the foot, foothills of the San Bernardino Mountains outside of Los Angeles, very near where the first LA Sahabas took place. At age 10, her family moved to Las Cruces, New Mexico, where they met Darwin Shaw's daughter, Leatrice Johnston, who facilitated regular Baba meetings. Baba has always been central in her life from an early age. Vanessa is a fine artist specializing in portraits of Meher Baba. Vanessa raised her family in Myrtle Beach to be near the Meher Spiritual Center. And she is a mother of three boys and one adopted daughter, plus two, two stepchildren, six in total. She takes joy in supporting the youth, the new Baba lovers, with the love that was modeled by Mayor Baba's Mondale. She lives in Charleston, South Carolina, with her husband, Laurent Weichberger, their youngest child, Francis, and daughter, Margie. She is full of enthusiasm in her life with Baba. We look forward to her sharing with great enthusiasm in his love and service, Jeff and Gohair. Jay Baba. Hey, Baba. Thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Wayne. And with that, we welcome Vanessa to our program tonight. Vanessa, we look forward to hearing your story. And uh, so I give it the floor over to you. Go Thank ahead. you. I'm really happy to be here. I feel honored to share my story. Um, you know, uh, as it said, I grew up in, um, I was born in California. So my whole early life, I, I got to meet all the Baba lovers and know all the Baba lovers over there. And then I moved to the East Coast. So um, it's such a, um, it was a, it was a journey of getting to know like the, the whole community. And now I feel blessed to be able to, to share this with you, my whole um, sort of discovery of my spiritual bath, um, really through my mother. Um, so I, I guess I should start. So I'm Vanessa Weischberger. I was born in California. I'm now married to Laurent Weischberger. Um, uh, we had actually originally met in India in 1990, but um, Baba sort of entered my life when my mother came to Baba. So I'm second generation Baba lover. My family, um, um, at the time, it was 1972 when my mother and um, my father were introduced to Meher Baba. At that point, they had been married for just two years. So my mother and father married when they were 19 and 21. My mother had me at um, age 20. And then um, in 1972, my father's sister, who... Um, we all growing up called her Susan the must because she was um, she was a little bit slow and she was a little bit different and she was a bit of a gypsy. So um, she had known that my parents at the time in the 70s were seeking and both their parents set of parents were um, not into God. They were um, pretty much, I think, agnostic. But my mother and father had were determined to find their spiritual path. And I think that's what attracted them to, you know, to each other. Like my mother was a Sagittarius and my father was a Pisces. And they were both, um, they decided that Buddhism was attractive. And so they were following a little, you know, that horde sort of path. And after, I would say like, I guess a few years of living together, they ended up living in a little village in the mountains called Mountain Home Village. 
and there was a Buddhist monastery just outside the village. And that Buddhist monastery was one of the um, first places where they had the first LA Sahabas. Um, but before Baba came into that, their world, they, um, Susan had come to them and said, you know, I know you're interested in spirituality. And I saw this book um, and I think that you would like it. And it turned out to be the book, Listen Humanity. So she, even being that was California, they, she might've found it in a gas station. She might've found it at a, you know, just a little bookstore. We don't know exactly where she found it. She wasn't the type of person that shared those types of details. But my mother, um, being that she was seeking, she decided to read the book and was just completely blown away. And so she gave it to my father and said, you know, read this. I think this is, this is it. This is what we've been looking for. So he read it and he was like, yeah, I think you're right. And so they gave it to their neighbor, Christy Pearson. So I don't know if you know who Christy Pearson is, but she's, you know, um, was uh, sort of the manager of the mayor on it for a long time up, up there. But um so she too said, this is, this looks like the real deal. Um, so by the time they all figured out, okay, let's seek and find somebody that knows something else about this, this, we got to, you know, search. So they decided to save their money. And at the time they were all very young, you know, they didn't have very much money. So they had to save just for gas money to drive from the mountains down to LA. So they would drive, they would take their little VW and um, pile all those kids in the back and they went down to LA and um, they went to the Bodhi Tree bookstore looking for something, some sort of book or some some resource. And they ended up finding um, through the Bodhi Tree that there was a another bookstore and this one was run by um, Judy Page or now Judy Stevens. And she had two um, daughters who were the same age as um, my mother's killed children. So it's my brother who was two years younger than I am and then my sister. So we were born uh, 75, 73 and 70. And so Mehera and Rabia were her kids. So that was my mother's first Baba contact. And um, they, Judy would hold meetings out of her little bookstore slash spiritual meeting place in Pasadena. Um, and then through Judy and a few other people, they heard about the Sufis um, in the area in LA. So as small children, you know, my parents ended up taking us down to these Sufi meetings where they would show videos of Meher Baba. So I remember coming in as a small child and the whole room was dark, but everybody was wearing all white. It was white turbans and white outfits and they would all be sitting on the floor cross-legged and we'd be watching films of Baba. And then we would go back home. So that was sort of like, you know, my they didn't really explain Baba to us. We just sort of were exposed, you know, little by little. And, um, my mother was very, very determined to really see if this was the real deal. So she decided that after having the three of us little ones that she would go back to work and then she would pay Christy to watch all of us kids while she made the money. So Christy could get enough money to make a plane ticket. Cause at the time, um, you know, there wasn't credit cards. They had to do, you know, they had to save all the money. They had to buy everything up ahead. And so they, I don't know how many years it took, but they ended up going in 1976 to India. So it was the three of them. It was my father, Christy, and my mother. Um, my mother had to do an incredible amount of work to do this. She had to work full-time and take care of us little ones. So at the time I was 
when when they flew to India, I was six, my brother was four, and my sister was two. So she literally cooked all the meals for three solid weeks and put them in the freezer and had to find somebody that would watch the three of us little ones. Um, and I guess Christy had to find someone to watch her kids at, so that they could all leave and go, just go to India, which was, you know, really unusual at the time, you know, to just leave your family and, and do that. But um, she ended up finding um, Brian Dragas and his girlfriend, who is now his wife, Karen, to watch us. And at the time he wasn't a Babo lover, but through the whole process of meeting our family, babysitting us while my parents went to India, of course he got curious and then a seed was planted. Um, and later he became president of the LA Baba Center and has done a lot of work in the Baba community. But um, so my kind of story, I think remember, I, like consciously I remember photographs being in the house and I never doubted that that was Baba like I always felt you know that I had a relationship with the person in the photograph I I couldn't articulate to you why or exactly who he was other than you know my parents you know told me his name was Meher Baba um I think when you're that young you know you're not really you know, thinking like an adult about, you know, things you're just sort of receiving and just, it's, it seems natural. It seemed natural. So, um, I do remember though, when my mother came to me and said, okay, I'm going to India and I want you to meet the person that's going to be watching you while we're gone. And I remember looking at her and, and thinking, no, 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 you have to take me. And, um, she, she said, well, you know, there's a rule and I'm sorry, but the rule is children under the age of seven are not allowed to come. And I, and I was really determined and not because I was afraid of being separated from my parents, which would be, you know, a common response. I really felt in my heart that I would be missing out on something very significant. Now, my six-year-old brain couldn't understand that, but my heart could. And so I was very adamant. So I kept saying, no, 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 it's, it'll be all right. You just have to take me and I'm going to be seven in November. And it was August at the time. And I said, it'll be fine. And she's like, sorry, I can't take you. So they left, they were in India for three weeks. And during that time, I was, how I put it, visited, I would say, by Baba's presence. So the reason I remember it so significantly was because, first of all, I wasn't really a napper, but our new babysitter was very interested in all of us having a nap. So he put me down for a nap. I, I would say it was around 3 p.m. And I remember laying in my bed and I was I had a white bedspread with a little like, um, I don't know, it was, we had a texture too. It was really sweet. And I remember just, you know, spreading it out over uh, like a skirt. And then I put my arms up like I had angel wings. And I just felt this incredible presence in this like love and peace. And I was just caught up in feeling this and thinking that I was an angel. Um, and of course, when you're six, you have an imagination, right? You're just thinking about all of these, you know, sweet things. And, and I just thought, oh, you know, this is great. And then Brian came in and he peeked in on me to see if I was, you know, sleeping. And he saw that I was in this incredible position and I had straightened out the bedspread and he looked at me and he goes, no, like get, you know, comfy. Like he just did a little position. He didn't actually have to say anything. And it just snapped the connection of the grace I was getting. And so that contrast of experiencing that love to having, you know, just sort of the normal experience of your daily life, it was so, it was so shocking in a way, because I, I just had embraced it so fully and it was feeling so lovely. So 
when my mother ended up coming back, um, you know, she had met Mara, she had met all the Mondali, and um, she was usually, she was more of the masculine of the family. She was the breadwinner. She was um, not really one to like share a lot of feelings, but I remember she said, you know, to all of us kids, like, I want you to come and sit down with me and I, ha I have something to tell you. And when she said that, that meant, okay, we better sit down because it's something important. So we all sat around and she said, Mara, um, you know, I met Mara and that was the closest, you know, woman to Baba and Baba was God in human form. And we're like receiving this download, of course. And then she says, Mara um, gave me gifts to give to you. So she pulls out of this bag um, dolls, you know, women with wearing little saris and elephants and bangles and all these sweet little um, things. And of course, being in the United States, we never see anything like this. It was so different um, than anything I had experienced. And I remember just staring at the clothing that the woman, you know, the sari was just so beautiful. Um, and the elephant with its little mirrors all, you know, um, glued onto it and the, the little um, sequins and all of the, it was just a, a magical experience. But when I held it, I felt that same love that I had felt when I felt I was an angel. And so the recognition of that love was that something that tied it to the fact that it was from Baba. And later I um, came to realize that there's a word for it. It's uh, And the word in Arabic is called Baraka. So Baraka is the love that you feel in an object or a place, or the divine love, I should say, that you feel in an object, a place, or a person. Um, so it was that Baraka that I recognized from that moment. And then later, as you know, an older teen, I learned that when any one of your family goes to India, energetically you all receive his love it's like the connections all receive it so again another confirmation that you know it wasn't something that I was making up like Baba was already planting the seed and having me you know connect the dots and these little um you know love moments of recognition so as I um grew up my parents remained with Baba and about, I would say, maybe a couple years after that, they started having the L.A. Sahabas at Pilgrim Pines. Pilgrim Pines was also very close to the little village that we were in. Now, when I say little village in the in the mountains, it was probably 20 houses in the mountains. And it was surrounded by state land, so no one else could, you know live nearby you were basically in a big forest with a, a beautiful um i would say river that came down it was all the snow melt that would come down so my daily life was running around in the you know in the in the little village and running out into the mountains and playing in the stream so just on the other side of that was the the um of the mountain where we lived was where they hosted this L.A. Sahavas. And I guess because my mother had gone and had made these contacts in India, when Pukar came to um, the States to do his tour, Pukar ended up staying at our house. And my mother was um, cooking for him. And he didn't know any English and um, I don't know if you know Pukar, but he was a very large Indian man. He wasn't the thin statured Indian man. So as a, at this point, I think I was seven. So this must have been a year after they had gone to India. He, um, I remember he would walk, we had a beautiful garden and he would walk back and forth in our yard and um, I was curious because I'd never seen a man just stroll back and forth, you know, um, 
just moving his lips and uh, not really talking to anybody. So as I was observing him, I thought, you know, I wonder what he's saying because, you know, he, he doesn't speak English, but he's moving his lips. And as I looked, I noticed that he was repeating Baba's name over and over and over again. And his presence was so intense. It was so um, charged. Uh, and that was the first sort of very tangible feeling of Baraka in a person that I got to experience. But it also felt similar to the energy that I had felt in the gifts. And then also when I felt like I was an angel. So it was, again, like another level of confirmation. Um, we ended up taking as a family a little, like I guess at the time it was like a, a film, right? So eight millimeter film of all of us walking through our little village um, with Pukar. Um, and when I look back at the film, he was so jolly and so he was smiling and he was just you know, like touching my brother's little blonde locks as we were walking. So he had a different presence, like, the, like, I guess his nature was very, very sweet, but I didn't see that in the moment because I was feeling the intensity of the, of Baba's love in him. Um, so then, uh, as I, um, got older, we just regularly went to the LA Sahavas. That was sort of our, every year our family would go and we got to then be exposed to more and more of the Mondale because they would come over and give the talks. So Katie and Bao and Adi and um, um, all of them really, I can't think, everybody who came over there, I think they came to the LA Sahavas to talk. So it was really a blessing. And I do remember feeling like my cup would be filled at the Sahavas and then it would kind of carry me through the year. And then we'd go back and we'd have that. And at the time um, we started, I don't know exactly what year we started. I'm thinking probably not until I was a teenager, but we started what we called the Mayhair miniatures. And Lois Jones, who was a lovely, lovely human being. She ran it all and she had just such a depth to her. And so she would leave these beautiful, deep talks about what it was like to, you know, follow Baba and being a teenager and what did spirituality mean to us and, you know, all of those things. So we had like kind of a bit of a grounding in that. And in the middle of going to these Sahavases, right when we were, let's see, I was 10. My father decided that he didn't want to raise us in California. He wanted to move to New Mexico. So we would end up having to drive from New Mexico to the LA Sahavases from, from that point. But I, I, um, it was, it was a huge shift, um, to move from, from California to New Mexico. And of course, when we moved to New Mexico, it was to this tiny town called Las Cruces. Um, and of course, some of the first people that we met was John and Leatrice Johnston. Um, now walking into her home, I felt that same love that I had recognized in Baba. So already I was feeling very comfortable. Um, I was still you know, at between 10 and 14, not really quite ready to like join a discourse meeting or, you know, so I, John, who was the head of the IT department for the New Mexico State University used to sit in the back room because he never would admit that he was a Baba follower or liked Baba or loved Baba. And so there was always this really cute dynamic between Leatrice and John because Leatrice, you know, of course, secretly wanted her husband to, you know, fall in love with Baba. Um, but he was, he was just, he was really the, he had such a huge heart and he would, he would show all of his love in action. So later when I got to be older, you know, we, we would all sit back in the room with him and watch, I don't know, some little cartoons or something with him in the back room. And then when she would have discourse meetings, 
And then as I got older, I would join the discourse meetings and then he would come out <laughs> and sit in the chair and just, he would never say a word, but he would just sit back, you know, put his little hands on his stomach and just listen to everything you know, that we would say. And um, never had a comment. It was just always very sweet and supportive. Um, and as I grew up, Leatrice, uh, really became a significant figure for me. She really became my spiritual mother. Um, and I don't know if you know, but Leatrice had one daughter, um, that was, uh, Sherry. Um, and, uh, she always wanted more children, but she, she only got the one. So, you know, John and Leatrice really adored their, their daughter. And um, I remember she was, she was also, she was, she was only like maybe two or three years older than I was. So we'd end up running into each other in the house, but she was just old enough that, you know, it wasn't cool to talk to me. And uh, she was, you know, it was like one of those things, but um, yeah. So Leatrice and I were both mystics. Um, I didn't know what a mystic was, but in, as I got a little older, I understood that my way of thinking about God and the way that Baba showed up for me, everything seemed a little bit more on the mystical end. Um, so Leatrice and I would have these lovely uh, teas together where she would, she would um, pour the tea and read tea leaves and we'd read the teacups together or we'd um, share about flower essences or, you know, um, read Baba's discourses. She loved painting and I loved art. So we would do some Chinese painting together. She particularly loved the Oriental painting. Um, but we grew, it was like an automatic closeness. There was no, like, I don't know how to describe it. So like the, the closeness that we had, I think she wished she had with her daughter and her daughter wished she had with her, but it was just immediate and natural. Um, so I think there was a little bit of tension between, you know, her daughter with me and her mom because of it, but I didn't, I didn't pay attention to it, but, you know, um, yeah, it was, it was a, an interesting dynamic, but I, I, um, I really appreciated Leatrice and I ended up living with both John and Leatrice, um, when I went to college, because I went there to New Mexico State University where he worked. So when he drove to work, he would just take me to, to class. So they really became parents because uh, my, um, my parents ended up divorcing when I was 15 and my dad moved back to California and my mom lived in Las Cruces for a little while, but then she ended up living in the Cayman Islands. So it was just me and Leatrice and John. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was very grateful for that. Um, but uh, it was because of my mom. I think she really like had this like awareness to to get all of her children to India. So she worked really hard. And um, I remember that year because it was... Um, I think it was about May of 1990 when she called me. I was in my apartment because I was going to college and she um, I thought she was going to call me to let me know that the passports had been approved and they were, you know, had arrived. Um, but when she called me, she called me to tell me that Mara had passed. And so I don't, I couldn't understand the reaction that I had because I had never been to India. I hadn't met Mara, although Mara had given me gifts. So when I picked up the phone and she said, without even speaking about anything else, she said, Mara just passed. I just started sobbing. And I didn't understand the sobbing. All I knew is that my heart had like this deep ache in it. And um, I was experiencing a grief, but I didn't know why. I just knew that obviously I had a connection to her, but I didn't, I hadn't no, this life, I had no reason to understand that. I it must have been past life. So 
when we arrived in India, it was July of 1990. So that was my first trip. So I was 19 and my brother was 17 and my sister was um, 15. When I stepped foot off of the plane and smelled India for the first time, I knew that was home. I that was there was no question. And of course, being a teenager, you're like, how is this possible that this feels more like home than my home? Like this is it was just such a an amazing experience. My my sister had a very different experience. I think she went into a type of shock. She'd never seen that level of poverty and she wasn't accustomed to the type of third world conditions that we were entering into. And at the time, you know, that the airport wasn't like it is today and there was people laying everywhere and like the bathrooms weren't even sanitary and the air, it, you know, it was just Everything was in the streets, you know, animals and people. And it was very, it was a big shock for her. And we, at the time, we used to take all the pilgrims used to go to the train station and then hop on the train and take the train into Pune. And on that time, we didn't understand that there was first class and then there was first class standing. So it was like first class seats and first class standing. And if you didn't, make that distinction when you got your tickets, then you basically didn't have a seat your whole train ride, which was, you know, like more than five hours. And it was a long train line. So my mother bought tickets for all of us, but they were all first class standing. So being that we were all young teenagers, we didn't mind, but other Indians were arguing with her about, you know, wanting her seat and that sort of thing. My mother didn't budge. She just stayed in her seat. But all of us, we we got up. And so we were literally between two cars of the train, hanging off of the train and looking out. And we were seeing like monkeys and palm trees. It was just, it was magical for us. I mean, it was almost to me, I would, I, I was like enjoying it. I was like, wow, this is great. You know, like this it was just so different from living in New Mexico and it was just such an adventure. So we, we loved it. I didn't even mind standing the whole time. I was like, this is, I mean, as a kid, if somebody said you can hang off the train, I would be like, great. So we loved it. So um, when we arrived though, um, we had, you know, you have to check in with the trust office and you had to put your little photograph in the book and fill out the thing. And that's when we first started interacting with some of the, you know, the people who lived in the trust and managed the office there. And immediately I, I felt like, you know, I was in a different world, but a world that I loved. It just seemed to make more sense to me. I don't, I, I don't know how to explain that. Um, so we check into the PC and, um, you know, we're introduced to like the fact that men are on one side and women are the other. So now my brother's on the other side, my sister and my mom and I are on the other and um, meal times and all that. And so we get settled. And I think it was like the next day, I remember my sister, she was kneeling over peering into one of the men's side windows and I thought, well, that's very inappropriate. That's, you know, not good. Like, what is she up to? You know, I'm going to go be the older sister and check out. And I go over there and she's actually looking in through the window, inquiring about um, a young man who was there who was ill. And um, she was worried about him and asked if he ne had needed anything. And uh, that person ended up getting up out of bed and opened the door and it was Laurent. And that was the first time that Laurent and I made eye contact. Um, and I, there was a recognition there. I don't know how to explain that. I, I don't think I could put that into words, but there was a recognition. And Laurent was there. I think this was his third trip to India. So he was, um, 
the chaperone for Lenat. Lenat was, a, you know, was a Baba artist, um, but he had um, an eye disease, which, you know, slowly had him going blind. So he needed ass assistance to go to India. So Laurent, you know, um, was kind enough to be his chaperone. But Lenat was a lover of life. So uh, even though he had health conditions on top of being slightly blind, you know, he at the time introduced all of us to kind of like, oh, let's go have a, a time in the town in like Amanagar and we'll go to a restaurant and we'll have like beer and chicken or something, you know, and he was just very like, you know, and so, um, you know, after, you know, doing several days of the normal RTs and prayers and that sort of thing, we all got together and took rickshaws to go have this meal. So that was the first time Laurent invited me um, on a date, I guess I would say, which was very sweet. But it happened that after that meal, Laurent ended up getting very ill and um, so ill that he almost died there in um, Maribad, but they rushed him to Amanagar and then that facility wasn't even um, you know, capable of handling his condition. So they had to transfer him to Pune and then they were like, you need to get back to the States. So um, Laurent and I just had a very brief sort of connection and then he had to go back and take Lenat back to the U.S. So that was really like my first trip to India. But I, um, it was significant in the fact that, you know, I, all of the experiences that led up to going to India confirmed my connection to Baba and that experience of when going into the tomb for the first time. All of it seemed very familiar. And um, I just knew there was a knowing, you know, I, I, I never had to question with my mind who he was. My I've always experienced, I think, Baba through my heart. Um, and then having a family that was very much interested in, you know, weekly discourse meetings there with Leatrice and John and having, um, I, my father liked to read us bedtime stories about Baba. So I had a very rich, I would just say, you know, like Baba influence, I would say, you know, from the time I was very little. Both my parents were very much on board with Meher Baba. Um, and then as I got a little older, I realized that there were other people in our Meher Miniatures group who did not want to follow Baba. They ended up, you know, becoming Christian or Jewish or whatever. Um, and then seeing as the years go by that both my sister and my brother still remained very much um, connected to Baba and seeing Baba as, as God. So, you know, I felt that our family unit, you know, had that sweetness to it, that, you know, not every family unit had a group of souls that, you know, were all under his Nazar, I guess you would say. Um, so I have enjoyed that this life. It's been nice to have a brother and a sister who also follow Baba and still, you know, um, see him as their master. Um, I, I, my, my mother actually, like, we're going to be just as a little hint for Laurent and I have another zoom called Sahavas for everyone that's coming up and we're going to be interviewing my mother. So you'll get to hear the story from her point of view. So you, you can hear her Baba story. She's never told it before. So this should be interesting, but, um, uh, before I go on, I wanted to ask if anybody has any questions about anything. What is your mother's first name? Donita. Donita. Okay, great. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? This is just great, Vanessa. Keep on going. Yeah. Okay. I enjoy it very much. <laughs> yeah. 
You so, definitely. Oh, we got a question. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, um, it's just part of my personality, but behave I'm, yourself, Richard. <laughs> I met you in 2013. Okay. In the ping pong patio of the original kitchen, and I <laughs> and I had to beg you and beg you to for you to tell me your story of how you got married, and so I got that, and then. You were gone, and Francis was like maybe three, and he was a terror in that little room. And so Kevin and you left with him out of the original kitchen, and that was the last I ever saw. So I came back a year later, and you were with Laurent. But the point where I'm getting is this led me on a trail of finding more and more and more about. Then you got connected with Margie, and I think Margie is very impressive. But anyway, so your mother is Donita. Is it Donita? Donnie to like it means little Don because her mother her father's name was Don oh. and she was the firstborn so they named her little Don Donita Donita and one last question so where did your brother and sister live when you were going to college in in New Mexico right so when my parents split there was let's see so it was about a year of everybody a split in the in the town of Las Cruces and then my father met Patty Thorne. Does everybody know Patty Thorne from the East Coast? I mean, from the West Coast. They got married, so they lived in the LA area. So um, my brother moved when he was 13. Um, and so my sister stayed with my mother in Las Cruces, but then it also eventually moved to LA when my mother moved to the Cayman Islands. So we we all actually ended up going to high school in the Santa Monica area. So Patty had two um, children and they were our ages. So she had Amber Mailer, who ended up um, living in India and um, caring and also editing works with Balna too. So she was, um, you know, for years she lived in, in Marizad and helped with Balna too. And then um, Dame, Damon, what, he, was, he was an amazing force. He loved Baba so much. And he would, in the LA Sahavases, he would do the, like a Baba rap. And he was just like a star, his light and his energy. But unfortunately, um, he died of walking pneumonia when he was 22. Oh, um, so he was living with another Baba um, mm -hmm. follower, Mer, Marwan, who was Terry's son, Terry Scott. Do you know the um, twins? Mm. Yeah. So uh, she was devastated. I mean, t Patty um, happened to be with my father in India when um, Damon passed. Mm. So they all prayed at the Samadhi for him. But Damon, okay, let me just put it to you this way. So, because I went to high school with Damon, Damon was such a light that all of the girls in the school would come to him for love and protection. And he, so he wasn't like a Casanova type, but he was like a, I don't know, he was like a man angel for all these women. So when his um, funeral um, came about there was like over a hundred of these girls from like all that he had met through the years that were all you know came because he had helped them like either protected them from a bad boyfriend or had helped them with something um, and he was a certified scuba diver and lifeguard so that was like part of his um, I don't know he just had a, a beautiful um, sweet you know mm -hmm. I guess it was kind of a rare thing to have a, a guy in the West be that, you know, I guess helpful. So he, he was very sweet, but it was, it was a hard thing when he passed. Um, Cause I, I did see him as a sibling. Yeah. So, um, and then I ended up coming back to New Mexico to finish, to do my college. And, um, and so I finished my college there and then, I actually moved briefly to the Cayman Islands. And that's when actually Laurent um, moved to Myrtle Beach. And he had asked me to come out and start a relationship with him then. But 
I was still, I still had a year left at college, so I didn't, I didn't follow up on that. And then he ended up getting married. And then I met Kevin in another trip to India. Um, and then we got married. So we kind of lived these kind of parallel lives, but not crossing paths in the Baba community, which was interesting because Laurent ended up moving to Arizona. So when I was in my Saturn return, so at this point I was married to Kevin. I had two, I had Narayan and Jalal. They were two and four. I had this idea because of circumstances that I was going through with my father that I would move to Myrtle Beach. Now I had never lived in Myrtle Beach. I didn't know anybody from Myrtle Beach. I had been to Myrtle Beach. Hmm. I should share about that, but I just thought this is, this is what I need to do. So that's how I ended up in Myrtle Beach. We just literally jumped in the car and drove from Lake Tahoe all the way to Myrtle Beach in July of 2001. <laughs> but um, my first trip to Myrtle Beach, uh, I was seven. So, you know, they couldn't take me to India, but my father was determined to get us all to Myrtle Beach. And at the time we had to drive our pickup truck and so it, the, you know, the pickup trucks, they only have the air conditioning is just in the cab. And then you have a back part of the truck, which is at the time my dad put one of those little covers on it. And so all of us kids, and I was the oldest, were in the back. Um, and then I'd never experienced humidity like the East Coast. So like, you know, when we were driving through these states in the middle of summer with no air conditioning, all of us kids in the back, the only thing I thought I could do was just open that slider window in the, you know, in the back of the truck and stick my head out through the whole, you know, country because I was just, it was just so hot, but it took us five days of driving and we got there. And I do remember the first time we got into Cove one, which it wasn't separated like it was now. So I guess it wasn't, it was just the Cove. Um, and immediately I started feeling that feeling of like, I'm an angel or something. I don't know. I just remember feeling very one with the forest again. And so I remember running through the center. And the first thing that Portia, who was Christy's daughter and I did was we, we checked into the cabin we ran all the way down to the boathouse. And we were on that little deck looking at the water, which had that, you know, the pond moss in it and stuff. And she fell into the pond moss right away. That was her our first experience. And so she came out with a cover and she was screaming. And then, you know, all the parents came. And, but that was a very like shocking moment for her. But I'm sure she remembered that. <laughs> I don't think, I don't know if she stayed with Bob. I haven't like caught up with her, but um, it was definitely a significant trip. I do remember um, a moment when my father took my brother, my sister and I to the beach. And of course there's no one on the beach because it's that beautiful, pristine Baba beach. And my father had somehow either fallen asleep or was in his um, relaxed state. And it was my brother and my sister and I holding a little square 70s style raft, right? So it had no, handles or anything it just was sort of like this little ridged little raft so I was seven let's see my brother would have been four-ish and my sister would have been two and the riptide came and we were all about waist deep but then suddenly I guess the tide was coming in and the riptide was going out and I had never experienced anything like this I just remember seeing my brother go under and my sister go under. Mm -hmm. And I had to make a choice. I was like, okay, well, my sister's little, so I'll lift her up and then she'll get on the raft and she'll hold on. But she was um, not able to, there was no handles or anything. So she just slipped off. So then I tried to get my brother up, and but my sister went down out of the water. So my brother was like, and then of course they're getting more and more frantic as they realize that they're drowning. Mm -hmm. And I'm, feeling responsible but then if I lift my sister up I go under so I didn't have air but if I lift my brother up then you know same thing I'm under so I'm like 
I need air too. But so I was running out of energy, running out of air. And I remember having this moment. And now I think it's significant. So this is like my a Baba story for me in the sense that I was seven. And I'm talking to Baba. I'm, I'm like, Baba, I guess this is it. This is this is what I'm going to die. Like, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm like and. Um, I continued to do the lifting the my siblings and because I thought, well, I can't live with myself unless I'm continuing to try to save their lives too and then finally I guess my father spot us and so he ran over and grabbed the two of them because he was like a six foot five very in shape guy and just lifted him up and ran off onto the beach and I was like so exhausted from lifting them and everything that like for me to save myself was like monumental. I was like really difficult. So I thought, okay, he's going to come back for me, but he didn't come back for me. And so I'm talking with Baba and I'm like, oh, okay. And then I guess, I guess we're, this is it. And I sunk under and I couldn't feel any ground at all. And then all of a sudden, as I said, Baba's name, my toes touch like the sand and the, the water shifted just for a second and I was able to walk out and just kind of collapse on the beach. But again, I think having something so significant happen and shocking, you know, I can report back to you now that like I was having a talk with Baba. I was seven and I was talking with Baba. It was very natural. Of course, I'm going to, you know, that's the person I'm going to be going to in my mind, you know, with these significant things are, you know, happening. So, you know, I, when I look back, I think to myself, well, consciousness really doesn't have an age, right? So like my consciousness as a soul following God was in a seven-year-old body, but my nature was to, you know, reach out to Baba and ask for help and, you know, have this dialogue with him, which, you know, now looking back, it's sweet. I mean, it may have been a traumatic experience, but it, it helped me remember those conversations that I had when I was little. Um, the second trip I went, I was 14 and I met Kitty and Elizabeth. And at the time, Margaret Krask was, was there. Mm -hmm. And I ended up in a one-on-one -on -one with Margaret Krask and she... I had never met anybody like her in my life. I was blown away by her character and the wittiness and the intelligence that she had. And, you know, at the time she was at this point aging quite significantly. And I don't know if you noticed, but her like eyelids were drooping so low and it was just like a shocking kind of physical appearance, but I couldn't get over her, her, force of being it was um it made a deep impression on me um and of course kitty was so lovely and you just wanted to snuggle up with kitty right away and you know there was no feeling of you know um a sense of division you know she always made you feel special and loved and um so the center definitely held uh Baba's presence for me, it was welcoming, it was warm, and the women were all very, you know, they felt like family, really. So I had that experience. Um, and then later I came when I was 19, and that's when I met um, the um, John Haynes, Charles Haynes, and Wendy Haynes, and their mother. Um, my first experience of meeting their mother, I was entering her house and she was having a very dramatic dialogue with a picture of Mayor Baba. And Baba and what? I'm just doing it. And I just thought, what is this? Like I've never experienced this before. This was very dramatic. It was, I was like, each one of these women was so unique. And as a woman myself following Baba, I was just blown away. You know, there was no cookie cutter way of following God. It was you know, it seemed like the closer these women got to to God, they all became more of themselves, their authentic self, and totally not worried about what anyone thought, like not not, not whatsoever. So 
I was staring at her and I was just amazed. And then of course, Wendy had, she loved puppets. So she immediately got out her collection and she started to do like a little puppet. I wouldn't say show, but she was connecting with us through the puppet and it would talk to us and, and we would respond and it was very sweet. Um, and then I actually got closest to John and I don't know if anybody really knows John that well, but um, John is like a very tall, athletic type. He very much believes in keeping active and um, he loved to influence others to be active and to be outdoors. And so at the time he decided that he would kind of take my sister, my brother and I under his wing. And um, so he played uncle for us and he took us to go shopping. He took us to go pup putting. And then he took us out on the gondola and drove us, you know, through the lake on the gondola. And then, you know, we went jogging together and, you know, he, it was, he was just fantastic. And I just, I felt like I had never met so many people so willing to invest their time and their love in people that were really strangers to them. Um, so that made a very deep impression. And of course, going to India, um, the Mondali were just the same. And I think, you know, I ended up having uh, a six month stay in my 20s when I went to in, in Maribad. And I had a conversation with Baba about it because I said, you know, look, I'm perfectly happy here. I don't really have to have the career. I don't have to have the marriage. I don't have to have the kids. You know, um, I'm ready to just be here. So, you know, I'm letting you know, Baba. And then Baba told me, no, you're going to marry Kevin and then you're going to go back. And then this is what you're doing. And so <sighs> it was, it was kind of a shock in that sense, but then I was so happy to be doing what Baba asked me to do, right? So I, I was feeling like blessed with the fact that Baba at least let me know what he wanted for me. And, and I was willing to, you know, do that, surrender to do that. Um, Mani what I met with, so I had felt that it was inappropriate to be with a man in, in Maribot, especially at that time. So when Kevin proposed to me, I went around to all of the Mondali and um, oh. explained what was happening. And I had made an appointment to talk with Mani. And um, I remember Mani was at the trust at the time. She was running the trust. So she came out from her office and she said, you know, what is it, you know, I, you know, you have, you've inquired and, you know, and so she asked us to sit on this bench that was outside of her office and it was little. So it was just, it was like Monty, me and Kevin. And I'm looking like literally right into Monty's eyes. And I'm like, well, I just want to let you know that Kevin proposed to me and this is what happened. And she just immediately looks at both of us. She goes, hmm. she goes, well, my parents were different. And so that was very confirming for me because I knew that Kevin at the time was a very different personality type than I was and our natures were very different. I think he was just more of an intellectual and a more of a heart-based person. So, you know, we just, it was a good combo, but it was, you know, we were different. And so she said, you know, you should try to please Baba. And I was trying to figure out. What she, and then, so she, you know, was like, well, you know, don't go to any dimly lit restaurants. And so with that, we sort of were like, oh, okay. What she was saying is don't, you know, like just honor your commitment and get married and don't mess around beforehand and all that. So that's what we did. But um, she was very explicit about that. And um, and I ended up going to Marizad and telling Erich and telling a few others. But Erich's response, I think, was the most, I think, Baba piercing I would say like as a young woman you know when you share information like you're going to get married usually you have a jovial response but 
um, I remember I went into Mondeley Hall and he had finished his talk. And so I wanted to explain to him that I was going to get married. And he just put his hand back like this and just slapped me right between my shoulder blades really hard. And he goes, ah, so what? And I was kind of in shock because I was like, what? you know, he was always so he was such a, you know, very chillax guy. And I was just kind of taken aback. But immediately there was a part of me that said, of course, of course. But the only thing that matters is Baba, you know, this whole game of marrying and children and the whole game that doesn't have any meaning. The only thing that has meaning is our focus on Baba. So I would get these kind of shocking, like, one-liners, I guess, from the Mondale. I could write them all down, but um, I think the other most significant one-liner I got was from Mansari. So every day when I was on that six-month stay, I would go in in the morning and sit with her and listen to her talk to the pilgrims. And I would just sit in the background. I was a little bit shy at the time. And so she would do her little, she was kind of a little fiery little um, she, and she would love to meet with everybody in the morning before breakfast. And this time I came in the afternoon and Mara Kleiner, who was then Mara McKegg, um, happened to be there by herself with Mansari. And I was, so it was just her and, and Mansari and I. And then Mara had the wherewithal to say to Mani, I mean, to Mansari, this is Vanessa's last day before she flies back to the U.S. Do you have anything that you'd like to say to her? And I thought, well, that was very sweet of her to, you know, to do that. And then Mansari looks at me and she goes, you watch too many movies. And I was just like, what? You know, like, again, I'm like young, I'm 22, you know, I'm really just wanting like to be loved and accepted and all that. And I'm like, what is this message about? So then even Mara was like, okay, well, I'm sorry, what does that mean? Like, what do you, what do you mean too many movies? Like, you know, and as I was trying to digest this information, I was thinking, well, I was in college. I didn't even have time to go to movies. Like I was always either studying or running between classes. And then I'm thinking, well, it can't be the movie theaters. So I'm like, if it's not the movie theaters, what is she talking about? And then I was just thinking to myself, well, maybe what she means is like the stories that I tell myself in my mind, which play out like movies. And of course, I kept going back to that statement throughout my life. And then, you know, it's amazing how some of these major therapies now, like, um, you know, the, I forget her name, it'll come to me, but, you know, they talk about, you know, we make up these stories in our minds and they're not real. And then we act, you know, out on them, even onto others, you know, we'll express emotion based on a something we made up in our minds. So that to me, was like another gift, you know, like, okay, you know, you can, it was a, a, a kind of a, a redirecting, right? I think Erich was redirecting. Mansari was redirecting my focus. Again, come back to the here and now, to reality, to Baba. That's all that matters. Um, so I, looking back now, I'm like, I just kind of feel blessed that they felt that I was, that I had the capacity to hear those things. You know, that I that it was, it would, it would something that would, would, that I would take in and I would utilize, you know, um, and, um, so that, yeah, so I, that I was open enough to, I guess, to receive that. So, um, I think in these little messages, even though they can be painful, they, they were also the most beautiful and helpful. Um, so it's not that I got what I wanted. It's like I got what I needed. Um, yeah, so that was, and I would say, you know, then the other most, I think, you know, I come back many, many times to Mirabad. So I brought my oldest child um, throughout his life. And then my second child I brought as well. And we stayed together even for three months I they stayed there for three months with my kids and 
so we were back and forth but um the i think the most significant experience that i felt from um one of my trips was the fact that i wanted to come but i had a four month old baby and everybody you know even myself wasn't taken by my own mother until after i was seven but i thought the most significant thing i can do is bring my child you know to baba's feet so i just didn't pay heed to any of the rules and regulations and kind of made that leap of faith and um i remember coming to marizad for the first time and i hadn't informed the mondali that i was bringing um narayan and uh, so i was very nervous and somehow when i got off the bus i was the first one to get off the bus and so i was a little bit panicking because you know they all line up ready to embrace you and so i'm walking up and i have this infant and um the first person that greets me is eric and instead of scolding me for bringing an infant he looks down with surprise and he sees you know this four month old baby and he's just got so much joy to greet him and i couldn't believe it, it was so healing for me and he just took narayan right in his arms and you know if you have a nursing baby they're usually not that happy for that long you know they they get fussy but he narayan just was so happy in his arms and so i was like hovering around ready for him to hand the baby back but he didn't he greeted the whole line of pilgrims while holding narayan and i just after I think about the 10th pilgrim, I was like, oh God, I'm a terrible mother. Look at this. He's such a better mother than I am. He's like, my baby's so much happier in his arms. He was just, and, um, and he kept greeting and greeting and greeting. And so then I'm like, okay, he's going to hand the baby after he greets everybody. But no, he goes into Mondeley Hall and then he sits in his spot and then he holds, you know, and you know, he sits kind of cross-legged and he put baby Narayan there and he gives his whole talk with Narayan in his lap. Now I'm like, this is like, what? it's like usually like two or three hours. Sometimes Erich will be in there. It's like, and so I just couldn't believe it. And it was like, he was, he knew in my heart how like, I felt like a type of criticism from people for like having a baby or having the baby make noise or having the baby be just a baby in these circumstances. But in the of course, in the, in the East and in India, they're much more accepting of noise and babies and that sort of thing. But Erich particularly, I think, was making a statement to everybody and, and knowing that, you know, there was that rule. And of course, after that, we finally, he finally gives me Narayan and I'm, I'm just like in, in amazement and I'm feeling very loved and very seen. And as I go around the corner to go take Narayan to the women, go hair is like scooting up in her little electric wheelchair and um she sees narayan and she's like oh and it's like i don't even exist she just takes narayan and even though he's only four months old she's insisting that he gets the full tour of mara's garden so she's explaining every flower and i thought well this is an amazing message this is like i mean to them he was like another pilgrim, another soul. It didn't matter that he was four months or if you were 90, it was like, you know, whoever he was, like they were just going to be the same loving, accepting, beautiful presence for this infant as they were for someone, you know, that was older. So I thought, wow, this is amazing. Um, and that whole trip was just full of sweetness. Um, the, uh, Erich, I, you know, I don't know how to describe it. He was to me like the embodiment of, I guess that perfect mother, but also father. I mean, he was a male, right? But he took care of Baba. So he was like that caregiver. It was just incredible. And Art of Oz, you know, didn't have children her own. She always wanted children. Her book was all about, you know, sort of the the role that she played and Baba said, you know, be the mother to to all that, you know, come through your life. And so I remember, you know, meeting her and and she immediately saw baby Narayan and picked him up, of course, 
And it was as if, you know, she had been holding babies her whole life and she just looked right into his eyes and she was like, oh, he was just here, she said. And I don't even think she meant to say that, but she did. So, you know, obviously like all these souls have their ties. And so I got to witness, you know, probably what I was experiencing as a child, right? Having connections to Baba, but not understanding it and then seeing it also in my own children. Um. Does anybody have any questions about India or? Yeah, I think Tina does, um, Vanessa. So go ahead, Tina. Um, Vanessa, I might have missed this, but what were your parents' names? My mother was Donita Moist and my father was John Stout. Okay, thank you. I'm watching you on my giant screen TV. <laughs> And you look beautiful. Oh, thank you. And yeah. uh, thank you for answering my question. Yeah. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I think, you know, the, the beauty of like how Baba works, I think, with all of us, right? So he is like weaving all of these little experiences Right. So it doesn't matter like when we came to him, it's just that he's it's like he's pulling us close. It's like he's making these little stitches, like he's embroidering these things. And then when you pull it, it all comes together and it makes the, you know, the design there. So I, th I felt like that's what he was doing my whole life. So that, you know, now I'm 53, I'll be 54 this year. Uh, and I'm so grateful to be in this phase of my life. You know, much more comfortable with who I am and um. I much more understand how Baba works and how he's works with me. And, and then with that, I can then be present and be, you know, of help with um, others. And I feel like, you know, um, the, the guidance that I got from Leatrice and her mentorship spiritually was so um, valuable to me. And so it was an inspiration for me then to help the youth when I ended up moving to Myrtle Beach. Mm -hmm. So I ended up taking in um, Margie and her little sister. And I took in um, also a young woman named Sophia and, um, and another briefly, another one um, named Haley and, um, all of these young ladies, um, came into my fold. And so, um, I just naturally started giving to them what Leatrice gave to me, um, and the Mondale. And I was just trying to be that kind of, um, loving, accepting presence, you know, which just giving slight little, um, how I put altering guidance, you know, if they got a little astray here and there. But um, yeah, so it, my household at one point, I think I had five teenagers, and then I had little Francis. Um, and so we started in order to kind of they, they were going through a lot like so Margie and her sister lost their mother to suicide. Just I think it was a not even a year before they ended up in the house with me. So I realized that they needed joy you know when you when you lose somebody like that it's you can go through a period of grief that's really tough so we created sorry sunday so del Ruba at the time used to have teas every sunday um after baba's house so i would get out my box of saris and i love saris so i have like 40 saris so we would all dress up in saris and then go to del Ruba and our saris um it was just a way to kind of honor that, um, you know, girls like to, to play princess or dress up. And it was a, a way to feel beauty and feel joy and feel love and feel connected to each other. So, um, and then we also played a lot of volleyball. So as you know, Jeff Wolverton was um, a big, um, you know, uh, he was big into volleyball, but the reason I think that volleyball was such an important um, element in um, the daily life of 
the center was that it was a way to have play. So a lot of adults don't have play. And when you play together, you can bond in a way that you can't if you're just sitting there talking with each other. So um, a lot of the children too would get to have relationships with the adults because we would all play together. So I would always try to include all the ages, you know, and all the parents and all of the children and encourage them to play volleyball. Um, and so that was, that was really incredible. Um, and so our routine was, you know, we'd school in the morning and then come over either volunteer for teas in volunteer and center, the kids would help with the cabin crew and we'd do volleyball. And so we kind of lived like an ashram life of, you know, just doing this little rinse and repeat. Um, but they all talk about it. They said it was a magical time for them and it was a magical time. And, and I think Baba gives us these little cycles, um, in our lives where, you know, there's a little treasure in each kind of decade, I think. And, um, that treasure was definitely, even though we were all undergoing tremendous suffering and pain, it, there was so much joy and so much, um, like camaraderie in our spirits, uh, you know, to support each other in this joy and in Baba's love. So, um, you know, we still talk about it to this, to this day, but I'm, and I've, I've learned to kind of surrender to the shifts, you know, that happen when, you know, when an era ends. And, um, I think, you know, the hardest era to end was when, you know, we really didn't have any more speakers left to talk about Baba at the center. You know, there was hardly anybody left who met him in person. And so, you know, I kind of felt like these kids were the last kids that got to come to the talks. And I don't know how much they absorbed at those younger ages, but, um, you know, their generation. So it would be Margie and so I guess they would be millennials, right? The millennials were really that last generation that got the people who met Baba. Um, and then witnessing this shift, um, and Laurent and I talk about it, but we feel like, you know, we're we're leaving that that beautiful treasured time when the actual Mondi would greet us like their own family. You know, I mean, Baba like set that all up for us and it was so special and rare. And now that era is leaving and now we are learning how to be that for each other, right? We get to see Baba in each other instead of just hearing about Baba through, you know, someone who met Baba. So I think that's the shift that I see now happening with Margie and my other kids is they're, they're learning how to, you know, be that connection for each other and support in, in Baba. Wonderful. Does anybody have any other questions for Vanessa? I think it's getting a little late. So um, we'll, if anybody has any other questions. Oh, there's Rich. I'm sorry, Rich. I didn't see your hand up there. <laughs> Go ahead. Actually, all I wanted to say was I remember when I did meet you in 2013, I was sort of a visitor in and out of the center over long span and from Colorado. And so I, you know, and I, I knew Jeff and blah, 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 but, but you really impressed me that night, uh, Vanessa. I mean, I was, I, I never forgot you. You, I asked <laughs> you one time is, uh, I, I always thought about moving to the, to the Myrtle Beach, Northwood Beach. And you mm -hmm. said, this is the only place to be. And it was like, I was just, I was stunned by your magnanimous outgoing, you know? Yeah. So thank you. I'm glad I encountered you. Thank you. I'm glad that I came across as being happy and jovial because I, you know, we were all going through it at the time. But I mean, if there, if you ever like, I mean, Baba does sustain you. And I have to say that just stepping onto the center, and I think all of you have experienced that is just so healing. Just that shift is so amazing, just going through that gateway. And um, I remember when the first time I had come, you know, uh, when we arrived, there was like three tornadoes that landed on the beach and um, it was a very, yeah, it was like a very memorable day. 
And, um, but I remember stepping on the center and I felt like immediately all of the, whatever had built up, you know, in, in my heart and my being, because I hadn't been there in a while, was just, it had melted. Now, of course, when I went back out to the world, it piled on to me again, but I just felt like it had melted. And um, I said to myself, I wonder if I'm going to feel this way next year or five years from now. Is it just, and it has always remained the same. Like every time I step on center, it's the same exact experience. Consistently, his love is so powerful. And, you know, it's like, you can't deny that. And, you know, I try, I've tried to, now I've lived in Wilmington, I've lived in Asheville, and now we're in Charleston, but I have to go back. It's like I, you know, it's like the moth, I guess, to the flame. I have to keep coming back. Okay. So I think we have Rick next. Rick. <clears throat> now, hi, Vanessa. Just want to thank you for your, your open hearted sharing. It's been really just lovely to share this time with you. <clears throat> when you told the story about your um, interesting proposal in India, I want to say Paula and I were there um, during that time. Oh, and nice. you, sat, you sat down at the table with us in the, um, in, the, in the dining hall and started to tell us a story about having a proposal from this guy you really didn't know and you just were quite sure <laughs> yeah, what was awesome. going on. And we thought, well, God bless you, girl. And at the same time, you had a you had a conviction. It was clear that, that you were oh. going to do this. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay, so I had an argument with Baba about it because I was like, okay, Baba, there's a lot of red flags here and I don't think this is the person for me. And so I just, you know, want to let you know that I said no to him and I'm really happy that, you know, that I was, you know, I'm because at that time I was ready to be there for six months and stay on for the rest of my life. I didn't need a guy. And actually, that's when Bob, I had this experience and I haven't had anything like it to that depth again. But he he said, no, I want you to marry him. And I said, but Baba, because I was started to argue and he put his hands on my cheeks and he said, he said, mm. you know, but this would please me. Mm. And so I was like, how many things can you possibly do in your life that would please God? And how would you even know what would please God, you know, unless he told you. So I was like, okay. So in a sense, it was an arranged marriage. I really didn't know Kevin. You know, we were brought together under that premise of my connection with my understanding to, of what Baba was telling me. Um, so I've had these little moments. It's not like I'm always hearing like bob is not always commenting on what to do in my life i think he leaves that up to us to to you know, to use our free will to you know like effort and grace like darwin says you know we have to make our own effort and then the grace comes right so that was probably one of those moments i love the I story think... sorry about your uh Vanessa? Your, your, yeah. your baby with eric thanks for showing that <laughs> yeah he was so sweet Yes, there was. It seems to me, Vanessa, that you had karma that Baba wanted you to finish with Kevin. That's why. He yeah, helped. yeah. It was interesting because Laurent, I guess, had karma to finish with his ex-wife, Lily, and I had karma to finish with Kevin. And then when it was done, it was just like, OK, now you can be together. See? Um, Clearly. <laughs> but Laurent actually did say to Baba, I guess it was like the week before. So I had had a, a moment in my life, especially moving to Myrtle Beach, I had a uh, packed with Baba that I wasn't going to have any contact or communication with men. So I wasn't speaking to men at all. I wasn't even, not even in friendship, not on the phone, not in, you know, it was just, you know, unless they were on center, it was just in passing or whatever, but I just, it was not part of my thing. And then um, I remember I walked into my house and I was making a curry and Baba said, I want you to call Laurent. I was like, but Baba, I have an you know, agreement that I don't talk to men. And he's like, no, I want you to call Ron. I want you to call him right now. So I was like, hmm. so I called him up. And that's when I found out that um, he told me that his marriage had ended and that he was coming to Myrtle Beach. And um, and that's when I said, I said, oh, well, if I'm ever, if we're ever single at the same time, maybe we should give it a go. And he, and so it kind of evolved from there. And then I ended up getting divorced from Kevin and then... Laurent and I it's got amazing how he has guided you as just yeah. I, I 
just astounded. That's what a connection. You're definitely an old, old soul that has <laughs> had a very deep connection with Baba. You know that. Right? <laughs> I, I, I can only imagine what that connection was, but um, definitely. It's know, so clear. It's it there. Is. It's definitely there. Definitely. Okay. Well, we have Ken. Go ahead, Ken, who's been patiently waiting. Hey, Vanessa. Hi, Ken. Thanks, thanks so much for sharing. Yeah. I just want to let everyone know that uh, if I wasn't on Jeff's team in the volleyball, I wanted to be on Vanessa's team. Because <laughs> she and her family were a whole team in themselves, but as the boys got older. But yeah, those those are the days. Yeah, I was I it was really wonderful to be able to bring like at least as many people as we could get to play volleyball because sometimes, you know, there wasn't enough pilgrims. But yeah, Ken, you were great. I I really enjoyed all our years together. Yeah, and you, as someone was saying, you know, despite all the stuff you were going through, you really always put a lot of light. Yeah, it was center. It was such a joy. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, every day that I was there, I always was so grateful. I was like, how about I get to come to the center again today? And I live right across the street. Like, this is amazing. You know, it's like, because I feel like, I don't know if you guys relate, but, you know, whenever I've gone to India, I've known that Bob is like, oh, it's your time to be in India. And when I can't get back to India, he's like, nope, it's your time to do work or whatever, you know, back where you are. Like, it's not your time to go back. It's like, I didn't always feel like I had free will to like, you know, be in his, you know, whatever his place is, whenever I wanted, like he had work for me. So I just felt so much gratitude that I was able to be in Myrtle Beach for all those years. Yeah. I'll see you on your next chat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And oh, and yeah. You guys it's not too early. Happy birthday to both oh, of you. Oh, thank you. And happy birthday to you, fellow Scorpio. Oh, thank you. Yes. You remembered. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you guys know, but Laurent and I have the same birthday. That was one of the, oh. the clues I had when I met him in India. I was like, oh, it's a sign. <laughs> we have the same birthday. Wonderful. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Okay. But a year apart, right? We're two years yeah. apart. So he's two years two old. Years. Yeah. Years. Yeah, so. so so is it today, Vanessa? Is your birthday? The fifth of November. So we're we'll be celebrating oh, okay. next week. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well wonderful. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. last but not least, we have Tony. Go ahead, Tony. Hi, Vanessa. We've never really met. I've been seeing you around now for a few years, but I really enjoyed this a lot. And okay. yeah, Baba, give me the words to say this because I'm usually open, but I'm I just want to say I, I always felt this connection. I, I Your mother, I, I don't know how well I know her, but I, I felt a connection with her always. And I felt a connection between, and with Margie. I felt that Aww. connection. Yeah, and I felt there was some connection between the two. And now I'm feeling that same connection with you, except now like, okay, I've got the whole picture. But it's the <laughs> same light. It's the same shine. It's the same yeah. sparkle. And it, it, it touches me. And I it touches me in all three of you. But I particularly enjoyed all these stories today. Oh, good. Yeah, you know, when Marky came into my fold, I, my heart opened to her so deeply. And all I can say is that it must have been a past life connection to her. Her sister didn't connect with me like Margie did, but we've definitely like deeply bonded and, and um, it must be from past life. So like, you know, she's living with us now. And I don't know if you all know that she's going to have a little baby girl <laughs> who she's going to name Moni uh, and it could happen. So my mother's birthday is Moni's birthday, which is December 15th. And now we have this new little one whose due date is December 15th. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we're, we're very excited, but um, I, if, if, if somebody told me, you know, how my life would end up unfolding, you know, I just, I could never imagine this. This, this has just been such an incredible journey. And um, I just feel so much gratitude that I could give to these girls and that they would, you know, in return, their love has just been um, so beautiful because it's all Baba. It's all Baba's, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to ask you the connection between Margie and you. You know, you look so similar too. So I was getting confused. I thought maybe she was your daughter. <laughs> well, she technically, I mean, yeah. So she came in to live in my house when she was 14 and she was 
prior, she was raised um, by her mother, but they were um, the the father um, was in like a twelve year custody battle to get the two girls. Um, so then, I guess that war, you know, it was stressful for her mom, and she ended up um, committing suicide. So when when I got Margie, she was, you know, she had um, definitely, um, you know, really lost that mother figure, and um, I don't think she intended on me being that replacement but um I saw her 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 state and I was definitely I just it just sprung from my heart what to do so I think Baba had it had you know yeah definitely. he had worked it all out so um but now we're so grateful for each other and um you know it's just been a, a natural easy I think we have more of a, a natural mother-daughter relationship than some mothers and daughters so i i just yeah. feel like okay again yeah i mean the same thing. thing with leatrice and i we just had that natural yeah, yeah. yeah. but that, well, i think that's the beauty of the baba community i really felt that you know that's mm -hmm. been a gift you know we are all really like so close being that we're probably the souls that have traveled with each other for many lifetimes that's right so like you know you and i connection might be more deep than even a family member that i have um just depends you know on the the soul history but um i've really 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 deeply enjoyed being able to walk into a room and say i've known these people for 50 years 40 years 30 years 20 years you know and all over the world and um and feel seen and loved and known in that way it's you and Margie are, you and Margie are kindred souls <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 it's wonderful how he brings us together right that's yeah. story. well um i i think we're going to end uh it's shortly after 11 30 so late getting late on the east coast so i thank you once again and vanessa for your beautiful sharing we all enjoyed it so much oh thank good you. Yeah. Take thank you so much and uh do come again um, so absolutely yeah. <laughs> well, let's say three avatar mehr baba jays and we end tonight. So avatar mehr baba ki jay. Avatar mehr baba ki jay. Avatar mehr baba ki jay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Jay baba. Jay baba. That was great. Diane, are you still yeah. with us? Yes, I am. I had to bring Terry in. Oh, to bed, okay. though. I have one more question. So, oh. But I'm not host. Betty's the host. I made oh, her the okay. host. Betty. Oh, okay. Thank you, Diane. Betty. I have one more <laughs> question. Uh, is, so where is the uh, Margie's, is Margie's husband living there too in Charleston? No, that relationship didn't work. She, he, um, it's a, it's a bit of a story, but um, I, I think to suffice it, say it's a new life for Margie. I think that's the boundary to just keep. Yeah, that's that's okay. okay. Yeah. Thought Margie was in Phoenix in business and married there she was she was living in phoenix and she um you know she does the astrology and she's um, a life coach and um she's very good at it actually so if anybody wants their chart read she's she's very insightful what was richard referring to about what didn't work in uh, i was just concerned about margie's well-being that's my only interest there oh no she's she's doing great here i mean she's got tons of support and love so I mean, we're, and we're all very excited. And um, here is Charleston or Phoenix. So or we're in Charleston. In I mean, yeah, she she flew from Phoenix to Charleston, so she's here. And she's got Lauren too. Yeah. So so Lauren, I think is probably more excited than any of us about this baby coming. He's already like, I'm going to make a sandbox and I'm going to like, I'm these like, he's like got all these plans and what he's going to do. So, um, and Margie is so thrilled. She's like, I've always wanted, you know, 
my child to have like a really beautiful, you know, male figure in her life. And so she's very excited about that. And um, yeah, he's taking it very seriously. He's, he's, he's ready to, to be the grandpa. So he's, I, I forget what name he's going to, I'm going to go by Nana and I don't know what, I think it was, <laughs> I forget the name. He had picked a, a, a neat grandpa name, but it wasn't grandpa, it was something else. So yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a, such a good thing. And now um, she's hoping that the birth goes well and that we'll be able to put the baby on Baba's bed, you know, sometime the third week of December or the last week of December. So we'll see. Um, but, and right now my mom is fighting fourth stage cancer. So we don't know how long oh. she's going to be around. Yeah. So we're hoping that she can fly out and see the baby um, before things take a turn for, you know, the worst. So yeah, we've got a lot going on. I've got um, a brother, um, who is got Parkinson's, he got it really young. And so he was thinking that he might pass soon. So we've got a lot of dynamics happening in our family right now, but, um, mm -hmm. I think having a baby <laughs> is going to just bring joy for everybody in the middle of, you know, I think, um, you know, Baba says we should really like rejoice with death because it's like, we get to to move on and you know and when we get born we should really like oh no like you know and as eric said you know oh do they know what they will have to slug through you know like, it's like uh... <laughs> but yeah i mean i i there is a convergence right now of a lot of different um energies um so i think that's i don't know if you know but my youngest son francis he he is 14 now. Um, and just in June, he started sending us uh, Zillow houses on Zillow for sale from Charleston. And he said, I want to move to Charleston. Oh. So he said that Asheville wasn't doing it for him. I don't know. I don't know why, but you know, so he, so Laurent just happened to um, kind of pick up on that and looked at the house and we thought, well, why not? We'll just go down there. Now we had no idea that Asheville was going to go through yeah. this huge storm wow. and everything. Man. And never in my life have I felt like Baba has picked us up and put us in another place. This mm. was so streamlined. It was like the flood was literally like we played shoots and ladders and we just went right to Charleston and I mean we were like a little bit like in shock that it happened so quickly because mm. we bought the house and everything we moved and um and then all of a sudden Marky was like I'm moving in with you and we're we're like wow like what you know it's like um <laughs> and then the storm hit and we just went oh it's like Baba spared us like he knew that we would be starting this new life and you know, he, he just, he was taking care of our needs without us even knowing what our needs were going to be. So, um, I just feel very, very like held in his grace. Cause I mean, it's just been incredible. I mean, a little bit, I mean, it was almost like we got whiplash, like moving down here and having it all happen. It was just, but so, and now we can drive up to the center and it's only a couple hours or, you know, so I have to tell you what I remember about Francis <laughs> as a little boy. Because mm -hmm. he was free on the center and he'd be at the top of that tree by the volleyball court at four years old. And then <laughs> the one I remember though, once he was he was laying on the windowsill in the in the side room in the refectory, you know, the high end there. Yeah. And either the screen was out or whatever, the window was open, and he just rolled out. He was like <laughs> Three years old or something, fell six feet on the ground and <laughs> got up. I guess <laughs> he was fine. Yes, I know. He was always flying around. Yeah, yeah. All my kids were kind of uh, they were good with their their motor skills. They would you know could climb. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, you play volleyball enough too, then you learn how to fall because you gotta <laughs> jump and fall. Where's your oldest now? He's amazing fellow. So, you know, it's so sweet because, you know, um, when I married um, Laurent, 
uh, Cyprus, his youngest son was seven. So, um, and we only had him on weekends and I had, he would get to see Francis, but he had wished for a baby brother when he was like three or so. And so then here's Francis come in to be his baby brother. And then right around age 12, Cyprus moved in with us when we were in Wilmington. So Cyprus lived with us full time from the age of 12. And now he's, um, you know, gotten accepted into a, a high school for performing arts in Manhattan and is living with his grandmother. But now he's close enough to Narayan, who lived with us in the beginning when Cyprus um, had moved in. So they bonded also as brothers. So Cyprus just drove up with his girlfriend to go spend the weekend with Narayan up in Vermont. And so I just before this FaceTime them because they were all having a blast. And I don't know if you saw that. Oh, I think Jalal is on right now. I don't know if he's listening or not, but he's he's on listening to the Zoom. I, I saw a, a Facebook post of Cyprus is his name. He's a handsome young guy, too. He's pretty mm -hmm. slick. Oh yeah, yeah. No, we got yeah. Uh, I, I, every single one. I mean, all the girls and all the guys. They all have the looks. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the most important is their hearts. Um. So yeah, I. It's just uh, it's been such a joy. Like you know, some people develop careers. I feel like I've spent all my time developing a family, but then having such a beautiful Baba connection with. The kids has been great you know it's been and so now I can see like his as all the baby boomers are you know dying and leaving and like my mom's generation you know I have this connection now to you know the younger generations through my kids and their friends and you know all of the Yusahavas um, attendees as well been such a joy to meet them living in Myrtle Beach which I wouldn't have you know, been able to, if I lived in another state. So, um, being able to have that and host, you know, kids when they were coming in, they would fly in, they would need a place to stay and then go on to the center. So Regina, who was 14 staying in my house has now just got engaged to, um, a fellow Yusahavas, you know, attendee forest, and they're just a lovely couple now. So, you know, you're seeing these generations now, like carry on, very sweet. I think Marion has the oh. last thing to say before we close. Hi, so. we've never met. I'm so grateful you told your all of this. I live in New York City. And did you say it's your son coming here for which which level of school? So he's in high school, but he um I don't know if you've ever met Cyprus. He's uh he's a he's got five planets in Leo, so he's a magnanimous. <laughs> personality and he he can act he can he he writes um music and um so he he felt Asheville was also too small of a city for him so he, he was ready to go to New York so he applied okay. his junior year to a high school performing arts in New York yeah. that's yeah. where my daughter went there my daughter who's 60 <laughs> she went yeah. there and then my her son my oldest grandson is going to be 20, who's 23. He went there. He graduated oh, from that's great. Yeah. yeah. It was that's kind of a shock because his, you know, the school got defunded uh, this last um, year. So all of the performing oh. arts teachers were fired. Really? I don't know if you know that. So uh, one of the big rappers, I forget which rapper it was, but you know, he's like a multimillionaire. He actually um, funded all the salaries for the um, oh. theater to, to be hired back. I'll have to ask my daughter if she knows that because that school was known. All of their performances and all were like yeah. so fresh that people I know who are famous uh, Broadway writers and and I know famous uh, uh, composer said would go there to performing arts to watch the performances because oh. it was so extraordinary and fresh and so i still make sure that every winter i go so i didn't know what was happening i'll have to ask my daughter but thank you i, I don't want to take any more time but that those well, connections you know, there's some um videos on youtube now you might see cyprus because he actually took the bus all the way up to the northeast gathering where laurent was just the guest speaker oh, and I cyprus see. was sitting next to him in one of the talks okay. but yeah he loved it he just really enjoyed going up to the northeast gathering 
So it's it's nice to, I love making, I call them rainbow bridges, you know, heart to heart. Baba's rainbow bridge connects us all. And so thank you. I'll say goodbye and good night. And thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Vanessa, very, very much. We appreciate all your sharing and your beautiful stories, all your deep connections. You're definitely- uh, Yeah, I feel oh, blessed. Yeah. Thanks for uh, listening. <laughs> yes, thank right. you. Okay, well, good night, everyone. Hey, See Baba. you. Good night. Hey, Baba. Hey, Baba. Thank you, Betty. Hey, Baba. <laughs> thank you. And Betty, your birthday, isn't it 